Ingredients act of love, and today's topic is uh, topic is uh, Israelites escape through the Red Sea on dry ground. And I'm reading, starting with the scripture Exodus 14, and I'm reading the entire scripture for emphasis. Okay, then the Lord said to Moses, "Why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. Pick up your staff and raise your hand over the sea." Divide the water so the Israelites can walk through the middle of the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they will charge after me. My great glory uh, will be displayed through Pharaoh and his troops, his chariots, his charioteers. When my glory is displayed through them, all Egypt will see my glory and know that I am the Lord. Then the angel of God who had been leading the people of Israel, moved to the rear of the camp. The pillar of cloud also moved from the front and stood behind them. The clouds settled behind the Egyptians and the Israelite camp. As darkness fell, the cloud turned to fire, lighting up the night. But the Egyptians and the Israelites did not approach each other at night, all night. Then Moses raised his hand over the sea, and the Lord opened up a path through the water with a strong east and the wind blew all that night, turning the seabed into dry land. So the people of Israel walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground with walls of water on each side. Then the Egyptians, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots and charioteers, chased them in the middle of the sea. But just before dawn, the Lord looked down on the Egyptian army from the pillar of fire and cloud, and he threw their forces into total confusion. He twisted their chariot wheels, making their chariots difficult to drive. Let's get out of here, away from these Israelites, the Egyptians shouted. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. When all the Israelites had reached the other side, the Lord said to Moses, Raise your hand over the sea again. Then the waters will rush back and cover the Egyptians and their chariots and charioteers. So as the sun began to rise, Moses raised his hand over the sea, and the water rushed back into its usual place. The Egyptians tried to escape, but the Lord swept them into the sea. Then the waters returned and covered all the chariots and charioteers, the entire army of Pharaoh. Of all of the Egyptians who had chased the Israelites into the sea, and not a single one survived. But the people of Israel had walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground as the water stood up like a wall on both sides. This is how the Lord rescued Egypt from the hand of the Egyptians that day. And the Israelites saw the bodies of the Egyptians washed up on the seashore. When the people of Israel saw the mighty power that the Lord had unleashed against the Egyptians, they were filled with awe before him. With their faith in the Lord and in his servants. They put their faith in the Lord and in his servant Moses. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading here and doing of his mighty, powerful, and magnanimous word. The same grave that the enemy is digging for you to bury you in is the same grave they're going to rot in. What goes around comes around. What comes around. Okay, you see what happened with the Egyptians when they chased after the Israelites after the Lord had commanded him to let his people go. But then he changed his mind and chased after them. And look what the mighty power of the Lord had done. Now the Israelites already had been complaining. Now the Israelites already had been complaining, okay? And they spoke their destiny out of their mouth. For example, in Exodus 14, 11, which I just... This is here to die in the wilderness. Well, I didn't read that, but it's in chapter Exodus 14. 
Why did you bring us out here and to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Okay, he's, the Egyptians are complaining, you know, that Moses had forced them to leave Egypt. If they didn't want to leave Egypt, they didn't have to leave. They could have continued to, be, to stay slaves. But who wants to stay slaves? You know, they prayed to God to free them. And now that they're out here free, they want to be a slave again. Some people just ain't never satisfied. You can't satisfy some people. No matter how much you do for them, they're always going to complain and bicker and whatnot because they think you owe them something. Okay? Or they go after selfish desires. Now the Israelites prayed for freedom. Then they want, because they were enslaved for some 430. They wanted to be free because they prayed to God to set them free. And then when God finally answers their prayer and they're free, they want to go back to being a slave. Okay? Why right, they're complaining and they're bickering. Okay? Be careful what you ask for, you just might get it. <laughs> but it wasn't. But it wasn't until the Israelites, it wasn't until the people of Israel saw the mighty power of the Lord being released, and then in the Lord and in more. They had to see before they believed. What does it take for you to believe without seeing? Why can't we practice believing before seeing? Exodus 14, 31, New Living Translation says, When the people of Israel saw the mighty power of the Lord, and I'm reading this again for emphasis, that the Lord had unleashed against the emphasis, against the Egyptians, they were filled with awe before him. They put their faith in the Lord and in his servant Moses. The Israelites had already said too much when they grumbled and protested. So it's not always good to complain all the time. You know, because, you know, I, 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 nobody wants to hear you complaining, you know. I know I don't like to hear nobody complaining all the time, whether I do something for you or not, or whether I'm just in the room. I don't like to have to fight for a conversation to get my word in, you know, or, you know, it's, it's more like a battle just to have a conversation. And then you, you deal with complaining people who are never satisfied. You'd be better off not to do anything for them in the first place rather than to do something for them. And then they complain and bicker all the time, you know, and you got to sit there and listen to that. Yeah, this is a significant scripture in Exodus 14. That's why I put the entire chapter there. And the story tells us of the mighty works of God and how God will fight for us, protect us, and deliver us. His, prom his promise, uh, protect us and deliver us. Uh, protect us and deliver his promise just like he said he would. When God's word goes forth, it, it doesn't come back void. It always accomplishes what it was set out to do. Okay, uh, God brought a plague of, okay, uh, God brought a plague of bloods, a plague of livestock, a plague of festering boils, a plague of hail, a plague of locusts, a plague of hail, and a plague of darkness. But it wasn't until Egypt brought the death for Egypt's firstborn uh, that the plague hit Pharaoh's home that Pharaoh finally uh, let the Israelites go. But even after Pharaoh let the people go, let the people of Israel go, and the people of Israel began to escape, Pharaoh chased after them again. So he went back on his word. Okay. A lot of times, you know, people will lie. They say, okay, you know, you can have that or whatever. Well, I'll do this and whatnot. In secret, they're planning and plotting. They say, okay, I'm going to do it, but I'm going to turn around and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take back what I said I'm going to do, you know. Well, see, God already knows that because it says in the Bible that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Okay, God made the chariots hard to turn and steer, so they couldn't get out of the, the, the uh, away from the dry land fast enough before the water flooded them and drowned them in the Red Sea. Okay, and then this time Pharaoh's army died in the same water that the Israelites escaped in. Come on, somebody talk to me. Talk to me. Uh, that's how God works. He will make a way out of nowhere for His children. And those who have turned their backs on God then. The same grave that you did for me is the same grave that you're going to inevitably rot in. The same mischief that you plot and plan for me is the same harm that will come upon you. It says so in God's word. Moses and Aaron and the people of Israel traveled to find water. The people complained once again to Moses, and once again Moses turned to God who helped them. Who in Exodus 15, 24 to 26, New Living Translation, it says, 
Then the people complained and turned against Moses. What are we going to drink? You know, they demanded. So Moses cried out to the Lord for help, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. Moses threw it into the water, and this made the water good to drink. It was there at Marah that the Lord set before him for them the following decree as a standard to test their faithfulness to him. He said, If you will listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, obeying his commands and keeping his decrees, then I will not make you suffer any of these diseases I sent on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. May the, may the Lord have the blessing to the reading of his word. Now God is yet giving the people another chance to do what is right, even after they complain and make it all the time. In essence, God is saying, stop your complaints, stop your bickering. Listen carefully to the voice of the Lord and obey me. You know, now you don't have to listen to the slave masters no more. Now you can obey me. You know, you have to obey me now. You know, this is what he's telling them. This is his, his commandment. Okay? But some of us, you know, do too much talking and not enough listening. You know, I, I work on my listening skills because sometimes I miss what people say. People say that I, I, when I listen to you, I'm actually doing active listening by acknowledging that I'm, some, you know, letting you know that I'm hearing you uh, throughout the conversation. Um, but then for me, that takes away from me hearing that word or two that I'm acknowledging you in with, uh, you know. Uh, and so I'm developing a different way of communicating. Or, you know, if you're on the phone, you know, I can't see your head bow, you know, like that, you know. But if I'm looking at you, then you can see, you know, the expressions or what have you. But if, uh, you know, so it's a matter of, you know, how you listen. Listening is just as important in communication as it is to talk. Okay? And a lot of people, like I said, they do too much talking and not enough listening. Okay, but people have said... Okay, I and mean, you can look them right in the eye if you're sitting right there, you know, if you're on the phone, they can't see your thoughts. The same thing with God. I, I hear him speak to me, but I try hard to listen and follow his instruction. And you may think the voice that you hear is a thought or a suggestion, or you may not even be sure where the voice is coming from. But the words could really be God speaking to you and trying to bless you with what you asked him for and move you into your next level of anointing, and you don't even know it. We need to be still and know uh, that He is God and that His words have meaning and sustenance and life giving nutrition. Food for the soul that is going to grow and mature in Christ. God has given His instructions to the Israelites and to Moses, but somehow I don't believe they were listening. They let it go in one ear and come out the other. Do you remember the instruction that God just gave to the Israelites that I read just now? The Israelites were used to the slave masters feeding them and providing a roof over their head and supplying their every need, telling them when to get up, telling them when to go to bed, telling them when they could go to the bathroom, telling them what they, what they every move that they make, they were told to do or not to do. Okay? But now that they're free, now they don't have the slave master telling them all of that. They're used to that. You know, so they're, they're, it's a matter of them getting used to not being free. But now all they have to do is follow God's instruction. Listen to God's voice now instead of, you know, thinking that the, the slave master is going to say something again, which they're not. Okay? Um, when you're free, now you have to depend on God. Okay? It was a change that they were not used to, like I said. You could take the Israelites out of slavery, <clears throat> but it seemed like you couldn't take the slavery out of the Israelites. So God allowed the Israelites to wander in the wilderness for some 40 years. I remember I read earlier in possibly last week's segment <clears throat> that uh, he could have took them, I mean, the journey was like right there. He could have took them around the short path and, and just led them right there. And they would have been there like, you know, a couple of hours maybe. But he, he decided to lead them around the long way because he wanted to establish his covenant with them <clears throat> and let them know the reason why. He had let them escape. Why he had, you know, uh, set them free from slavery. I didn't just set you free because you just you prayed. Not that wasn't the only reason why I set you free because you asked me. I set you free for a reason. You know, I want you to listen to my voice. I want you to know that I am the Lord thy God, 
You know, you, you don't have no slave master no more. Now you have to depend on God. Okay? If you gotta do is just listen to the voice of the Lord and obey Him. <clears throat> and establish His covenant. He's gonna establish His promise. His promise with you, you know, that He set forth before you and allow you to dwell in the promised land as free men and women and children. Okay? Uh, but they bickered and they complained all the time. Okay? And some were sucked into the ground right then and there for their complaining to Moses about the food and being disobedient to God, even after God has said, listen to the voice of the Lord, you know. So, now, you are more than a conqueror through forgiveness. In 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 12, New Living Translation, it says, and I like the scripture, <clears throat> we are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven in despair. <clears throat> we are hunted down, but never abandoned by God, we get knocked down, but not destroyed. Uh, and through the suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. Yes, we live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus, so that the life of Jesus will be evident in our dying bodies. So we live in the face of death, but this has resulted in eternal life for you. Okay, so even though they looked like they were perishing, they were not going to perish because they were just resembling what uh, what Jesus had experienced when he was on the cross, when he was in his dying body, okay? But in reality, it wasn't the end, it was the beginning, okay? And as a result of him looking like, or them looking like they were going down for the count, they were actually being renewed, their bodies were being renewed. He said, we are perplexed but not driven to despair, hunted down, but never abandoned by God, knocked down, but never destroyed. You see, those are the key words right there. Okay, may the Lord add a blessing to the reading here, doing of his mighty, powerful, and magnanimous word. Now, by forgiving the enemy, you will become stronger and more rooted to fight every battle that comes against you. Through Christ and in doing so, you win over the enemy at his own game, you will be successful in disabling the enemy from succeeding in their efforts to overwhelm you. Trust in the power of God and he will give you the strength you need to overcome the wiles of the devil every single time. <laughs> efforts may seem to be prospering against you, but it only seems that way, okay, in the natural, okay. The, en the enemy operates in the physical, fleshly realm. A child of God, which is you and me, operate in the spiritual. The enemy fights his battle in the flesh. We fight our battles in the spirit. We fight our battles in the spirit and in the flesh, but more so in the, in the spirit. Our battle position is mostly on our knees praying to God, praising the Lord, uh, congregating in the congregation of the, the saints and the church, uh, visiting the house of the Lord, praising and worshiping, worshiping God, you know, adhering to his word, studying his word being obedient to his word, and a host of other things, but primarily those, okay? The enemy has many battle positions, but none of them are in communication with God. The enemy's master controls, the enemy's master controls their thoughts and actions and leading and guiding them in their effort to bring Christians down. God knows all, sees all, is in control of all, so the enemy is plotting and planning to incapacitate you, okay, to no avail. Okay, that's why they go to and fro to see, where can, to see who they can devour. They do this daily, hourly, okay, every minute, every second, until, until you tell them to leave. When you say, in the name of Jesus, Satan, I rebuke you and I command you to go, take your workers of iniquity, your beasts of the field, your evildoers, your fallen angels, your demons, take them with you now, go now, in the name of Jesus, and go, and go to the place appointed to you, for you, by my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And you say, thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. And, and sometimes you can actually feel the presence of the devil leading you, in faith, because it's in the spiritual chain of command, that Jesus is at the right hand of God, we sit at the right hand of Jesus, and the devil is under our feet. The devil has to obey us, Unless of course you're his ma he's your master, and you can't uh, you can't have control over uh, the enemy if he's your master. Okay, but when you you have to tell him to go, and sometimes you have to do it more than once a day. 
because otherwise he's going to whisper sweet nothings in your ear. He's going to constantly be trying to uh, persecute you and prosecute you, okay, for things that God has long since set, set you free from. Like with the case of the Israelites, they were set from freedom. And the enemy was, the, the devil was still trying to uh, make them think that they were still slaves, put in their heart to complain all the time. They, and, and rather than them trusting in the Lord God, they chose to uh, still act like they were uh, sinners. They still continue to sin. When you complain, you're sinning. That means that you're operating in fear and not in faith. Okay, it takes it, it takes a, a little doing to operate in faith. I'm not saying it's easy because you're not going to just all of a sudden be like, oh, I have so much faith now. But all you have to do is have faith as a mustard seed, a little tiny bit of faith is all you need to start. And as you continue to trust in the Lord <clears throat> and believe in Him and know in His power and His might, and know that he's capable of doing what he said he's going to do, that he's going to make a way out of no way. He's going to deliver you out of the hand of the Egyptians and through the Red Sea. And the same Red Sea that you escape in is the same Red Sea that the enemy's going to drown in. Come on, somebody talk to me up in here. Okay. Now, we are more than conquerors because we forgive for several reasons. First, and therefore, we are not judged. It says, judge not that ye be not judged. We do not attack or criticize others, and therefore, we are not attacked or criticized. You learn. This is something that you learn how to do. It's not something that you... It's like learning another language, really, you know, because you, you have to operate in a different realm now. You know, you're operating differently. You're not operating the same way you used to operate. You know what I'm saying? Um, Luke 6.37 ESV says, Judge not, that ye be not judged. Condemn not, that ye be not condemned. Forgive, and ye will be forgiven. Okay? Now, according to Hopkins Medical Studies found in the Act of Forgiveness, found that the Act of Forgiveness can reap huge rewards for your health, lowering the risk of a heart attack, and uh, improving cholesterol levels in sleep, and reducing pain blood pressure and levels of anxiety, depression, and stress. So the opposite is true if you don't forgive. Forgiveness does not erase the, pa the past, okay, but looks upon it with compassion. To withhold forgiveness keeps alive emotions of hurt, anger, and blame, which discover and per your perception of life. Forgiveness liberates the soul, mind, body, and soul, really. It removes fear, and that is why it is such a powerful weapon. Psychologists generally define forgiveness as a conscious, deliberate decision to release feelings of resentment or vengeance toward a person or group who has harmed you, regardless of whether they deserve your forgiveness or not. Forgiveness does not mean forgiving. Forg forgiveness does not mean forgetting, nor does it mean condoning or excusing the offense nor does it mean hanging out with the offender. It does mean, however, that you are releasing your fears and converting those fears into faith. In God, unlike the Israelites were doing, they were still operating in fear. Turning your worry and doubt into trust in the Lord. Releasing hate and moving towards love, walking away from insecurity, and embracing God's protection and forgiveness is the highest and greatest act of love. The Israelites were not uh, acting. Israelites were not uh, Forgiveness. They were obviously, they were probably unforgiving because they still hadn't forgiven their slave masters for enslaving them and making them work as hard as they did without pay. Okay? I mean, come on, somebody talk to me. Now that they're free, you know, this is completely different than it was when you was a slave. You know, it's something that you got to get used to, but yet and still, they're still operating in that realm. And so whether their bodies deteriorated because of the unforgiveness or whether God just took them out of here, nevertheless, forgiveness, unforgiveness can kill you if you're not careful. Okay? So today we've been talking about uh, the Israelites escaped through the Red Sea. Okay? And for, like I said, forgiveness does not mean forgetting, nor does it mean condoning. I always say that. I emphasize that a lot because a lot of people think that, you know, and I never tell the enemy to their face, I forgive you. I have... Um, but sometimes, like, you know, you call them up or whatever, or, you, you know, you ask and you talk to them, even after they've been so cruel and harsh to you, 
I had uh, somebody told me I was trying to, you know, to see where they were at, you know, these some odd years later in terms of whether we could get along now, you know, or whether they were still just as trifling uh, as they were when we were younger. So I called them and I, you know, I talked to them and whatnot. And the first thing out of her mouth was, you don't even remember what we did to you. You know, so that means that lets me know right then and there, hey, you, you know, you're operating out of unforgiveness. You're still, you're, you're bragging about, you know, what you did to me, like you're proud of it, you know. Uh, and so I said, well, I said, I remember what I need to remember. I said, but I thought that we could be family again, you know. And then God, you know, after I hung up, I told myself, well, you know, I'll I talk to you later, bye, you know. And after that, God had, uh, you know, opened up my eyes to help me to understand why uh, she or he or they were the kind of people that they are, why they, their mentality is so corrupt and so down in the gutter, so to speak, you know, because of their the way they were raised. But, uh, you know, he also reminded me that people have a choice. You know, you choose to be, you know, unforgiving. You choose to be haughty. You choose to be proud. You choose to decide, you know, whether you want to boast and brag about the way you treated somebody years ago. Yeah, I am from you trying to forgive you. But see, that's why I say you can't hang out with the offender because a lot of times they haven't changed. They're still the same way that they were back in the day. You know, and if you hang out with them, then what they're going to do, they're going to try to finish the job. You know, they're going to look at you like, oh, she don't even remember what we did. You don't even remember what we did to him. You know, so, you know, let's, let's, let's get him back. Let's take over. You know, let's do it again. Because it, it's, it's still in their blood. They, they never really got over uh, being the way that they were. They're hurt. They're hurting. They're in pain. They're in unforgiveness. And the unforgiveness is possibly killing them. It says right here that a study um, that was done. You know, called Hopkins, Hopkins Medical uh, Studies. You know, it, the opposite is true. If you uh, don't forgive, you know, you're at risk of heart attack. You're at risk of your cholesterol levels, your sleep, uh, pain increasing, your blood pressure going up, levels of anxiety and depression and stress rising to the root, you know, which could be fatal. You know, a lot of people don't even think twice about that. They don't think, hey, listen. You are unforgiving, you know what I mean? Your heart ran to do this in your heart. A hardened heart can lead to arteries. So anyway, I want to thank you for joining me today for that uh, segment. And we're going to talk about some more interesting topics next uh, next time we meet. And my name is Dr. Sylvia Black, and I ask you to holler at the sister. Peace out. If you want to pre-order the book, just email me at the email at the bottom of your screen. And we're going to talk about some more interesting topics. Just check out my YouTube channel. And, and my other books on YouTube channel, and, and my other books that are available on YouTube. So I'm going to ask you how long.